get started. So I have 80 minutes. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we're going to see how much I get through. So what I did was, uh, maybe I should introduce myself, get this whole setup going. So uh, my name is Ryan. I'm uh, at ETH, professor, assistant professor at ETH Zurich. Um, uh, but I'm American. I'm one of those strange Americans that left my home country. Uh, I do research at ETH in a variety of topics, computational linguistics, natural language processing, formal language theory, and machine learning. I'm a member of the Institute for Machine Learning. And I did my PhD, actually I did all my degrees at Johns Hopkins. I've highlighted the S. It should not be left out. Some people do. And then, um, you know, you just have to shake your head at them. Um, and I grew up in Baltimore about five minutes away from the campus and, you know, I was always planning to move away from Baltimore, uh, but somehow it didn't happen. Uh, and then I eventually went to Cambridge, but that wasn't quite European enough, so uh, I left. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just look at the, they're not quite American, but they still charge their students uh, 10,000 pounds to go to university. And it's got to be free. Okay, um, so what I did today was I, I teach a course, a graduate course in NLP at ETH, um, and it's been evolving because I, I recently graduated, so it's, it's, uh, it's been evolving over time. So I ripped out two of the lectures and modified them a bit, uh, and we're going to see how this, this all works out. Um, if you want to, you can go to my website, which um, it's not very hard to find if you Google me, but I don't have a link, and you can get the full content with assignments if you just can't get enough of my view of NLP. Um, many of the students did get enough. So, <laughs> some great recommendations. Well, actually, the, some students did like it, just not all. Okay, uh, so this talk is gonna focus on a couple of different things, or this lecture. It's gonna focus on language modeling and context-free grammars. Um, so this is the first lecture. This is two lectures in my course, and we're gonna go through it a bit faster, maybe skip some sections uh, to fit in the time limit. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is structured prediction. So this is sort of a, a, a term that I want you to know. And I spent a lot of time in my course motivating structured prediction. And the reason, um, and so the philosophy of how I teach NLP, is that why, why, why is there an NLP course? Um, and that's actually a very hard question to answer. So if you wanted to publish a paper at ACL, um, I contend that most of what you would need to know is going to be taught to you in a deep learning course, an advanced machine learning course, of which there are many great ones at ETH. Uh, and so so what, is, what makes my course different? Because I don't want to just teach an applied deep learning course where we apply some neural networks to language data and call it science. Um, so instead, I focused on a series of problems that fundamentally don't really pop up when we when you learn machine learning. And this is, this is structure prediction, of which language model and parsing will be examples. Um, now these pop up all over machine learning, but they're more common in NLP. Okay, so in machine learning, we often uh, model distributions over small sets. For instance, Niels talked about a classifier uh, for, I believe it was spam classification. Uh, and when you have a spam classification uh, system, you want your system to say spam no spam. That's two outcomes. But what if you had a really, really, really large number of outcomes? Like, you know, I have this little in, in indicative drawing of a little maze. So it's like, what if the set of things you might want to predict is really big? In the case of language modeling, it might be infinite. So what if I'm trying to come up with a classifier over a very large number of things? What does that mean? Um, so the big picture, is that this ends up looking a lot like multi-class classification, uh, but we, we, we have some sort of algorithmic aspect involved and some additional thinking we have to do. Um, so classes of problems that look like this are predicting strings, which is what we're talking about for language modeling, trees and objects, you know, graphs, circuit objects. Um, and it's really, as I, I explained to people, it's the intersection of algorithms and high dimensional statistics. Uh, and we have to think very carefully about our problems. And what I like to tell, I guess, some of my, my colleagues who, who wonder why they, we're not housed in a linguistics department is that this is, this is what makes this a computer science discipline in many ways. Okay, 
So recap, uh, NLP, and I, 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 I put this slide on here. Uh, so this is my notation. It's slightly different than what Niels did. So uh, NLP often um, models like this. We have some conditional distribution. So we're trying to predict a Y, give it an X. Um, and what are we going to do? We're going to put in this function. So what's the, what's the anatomy of this function? We have the exp in there. And it doesn't have to be exp. Exp just has this wonderful property that it's positive. So if you wanted to make sure you're, you have a probability, you know, because probabilities can't be negative, uh, you can put the x spin, uh, and then we renormalize it. And I've written this thing called score. Uh, and score can be anything. It can be a neural network. It can be whatever you want. Uh, in Niels' lecture, he, he basically showed you a linear model. It's the, what I call it a log linear model. You have an exp of linear function. If you take his log, it's, it's linear. It's very compositional. Um, and the question that I care about, for instance, is a very similar problem, a uh, very similar notation to what Niels used where we talked about z. The problem that we care about in structured prediction is that what if the number of elements in y is really big? And I mean so big that you cannot just want a for loop. Because whenever a computer scientist sees a little sum end like that, you might say, well, that's a for loop. But what if it's really big? Okay. Okay, so in my little meme situation, we might say, okay, we have, uh, we have sentiment analysis of two classes, maybe we have movie genre prediction, uh, and then we have something like part of speech tagging, where you say, why is that big? If I want to assign, to see that if I want to assign a part of speech to every word in a sentence, and I have t parts of speech, and the sentence of a length n, I have t to the n different part of speech taggings that I could assign. Okay. Um, so the bottom line is, is I have this big slide with this big obnoxious coloring that says this, this is sort of a lot of what people care about in NLP. The intersection of statistics and theoretical computer science. Okay. So what I want to get to now, and this is um, a few slides I added for this, this class, uh, is what is a language model? So um, I just added these, so we'll see if they're... Okay, okay. So um, language models are all over the news. For instance, here's a recent article in the New York Times, um, and this featured some research that my group was doing, and they, um, they wrote about it, and everyone wants to, I mean, it's, it's still surprising to me that someone from the New York Times wants to write about some small language models we're building. Uh, but the point is that this is hyped. And I, I don't need to tell you it's hyped. You've, you've all heard of large language models before you came here. Um, but what most of you might not be able to do and in fact, this is something that even sometimes experienced NLP researchers cannot do, is define a language model. Which is, if you had to write down a mathematical definition for a language model, could you do it? That is something that you'd find in a textbook, a math textbook. Does anyone think they could do it? Anyone take it? Yeah, you know the answer. Anyone other than Niels? Yes? So I, I would formulate it as a next word prediction. Is next word prediction? Yeah. So so you have uh, some context. Pre yeah. Previous generated words. You have uh, you are predicting one of the classes where you have uh, one the classes uh, part of the vocabulary, and you are doing next word prediction, and you have like uh, uh, conditionally. Uh, you have the probability of y given x y, y from the previous step, from the second previous step, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, I'll, 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 I'll repeat that for everyone. It's a network's next word prediction, so some model that predicts a word given a context. Now we're going to discuss that, but part of what I'm going to contend is that that is a very common way people define it, but that is neither necessary nor sufficient to be a language model for, for reasons I'll get into, but that is the most common formulation. Um, and th that's, that's sort of why I like to, to break things down from the beginning um, in the sense that what I would say is the fundamental thing that I want to teach you, and this is my view, you don't have to agree with my view, is that a language model is a probability measure over sigma star. So uh, it's true, for instance, you can prove that any probability measure over sigma star can be written in terms of next word predictions. That's just a little more work than the chain rule of probability. But um, there, are, there are, yes? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. They say, fear not, we will cover all of this. We will, you will meet Sigma star. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Um, but um, 
You can also have a language model that doesn't do that. For instance, these are often called energy-based language models in literature or globally normalized language models. And more interestingly, if you just have a system that predicts the next word, you can have something that isn't a probability distribution at all. It can put probability mass on infinite strings. Uh, and we, we typically like our strings to be finite in natural language. Um, okay, so let's get into language modeling and structure prediction. Um, so the way I view uh, language modeling this is, is that we have some finite set of words. Um, and if you know, typically, if you, if you read the formal language theory literature, they'd say this is called an alphabet, what I'm calling V, and it's a finite non-empty set. Um, so the task is then to come up with the distribution over all the sequence of symbols or tokens from V. Uh, and we often pad it with BOS and US to look like this. For instance, we might say we want a probability distribution over all sequences of strings. And I've just put little bookends just because that makes it a bit clearer. Uh, so this star, we're talking about sigma star, this star, I switched to V for vocabulary, is called the Kleene closure. Um, and it's basically a way of saying all possible strings you can make over that alphabet. So Kleene, uh, who's up there in the corner in purple, actually, I mean, it's, as a fun aside, I don't know if I have it on this, I do have it on the slide. Uh, apparently, well, everyone in computer science says Kleene. Uh, but apparently he pronounced his name as Claney, uh, in case you were curious. Um, but what Claney did, he was, he was a, a very famous logician in the early 20th century, and the, the Claney closure of a set, it's, a, it's actually a much more general notion, uh, for instance, the set we had V on the previous slide, is going to be the set of all strings, including the empty string you can generate from it. Okay. Um, so, in general, this will be, I mean, the, the case of strings, this is an infinitely large set, okay? Um, and even if in some applications like machine translation, we bound it with an upper length of say n, it's still a very, very large set. So this is the task of language model, I mean, as I'm gonna sort of teach it to you as generative language modeling, which is our job is to construct a probability distribution over this set. Now this, this requires a lot of different branches of mathematics to really get into the details of it. Um, but we're gonna sort of skip to the basics. Okay, so one way of visualizing the Kleene closure is through a prefix tree. Um, so what we do is we start with BOS at the top and I can put all of the nodes in sort of this infinitely large tree, okay? So What's interesting here is that uh, this last sentence, so this last sentence trips a lot of people up, so I'm gonna spend a lot of emphasis explaining it. So there's an uncountably infinite number of paths, each of which has finite length. Now that's often a very weird notion for people. Um, so if I tell you there's an infinite number of things, each of which is finite, you know, it's, it's a very weird notion when you first think about it, but then you have to sort of realize, well, I know a lot of sets with that property. The integers, for instance, infinity is not an integer. There's an infinite number of in integers, a countable number of integers, but they're all finite. But what they're not is they're not bounded, which is I can't find some finite bound for which all integers are less than that bound. So this is very similar with the strings. And I, this, this, this is sort of a very subtle notion that I encourage you to think about just because we have this, we have the infinite set, but everything in that infinite set is, is, is finite. So all the strings are finite. So again, we can visualize this as a prefix tree. So I start at BOS, I have this infinitely descending tree. Um, and what we're gonna do with this infinitely descending tree is we're gonna use it to construct a distribution. Now, before I go forward, I wanna make clear that what I'm talking about here is sort of the fundamental mathematics of language modeling. Every language model, if it is a true language model, there are things that are not true language models, like um, maybe you've heard of BERT, that is not a true language model. But if you have a true language model, um, they're often called autoregressive language models, or even um, some people call them causal language models these days. Um, they can all be written in this form. Can you why, is BERT not a language model? why is BERT not a language model? So, as I said, um, no, no, I go the other way. <laughs> 
Uh, so I defined language modeling as being a probability measure over sigma star. Uh, that is a definition that's consistent with the history. Like if you go back to what it means to evaluate a language model, the traditional metric is perplexity. Perplexity is the exp of the uh, cross entropy of held out data. And to assign probability to held out data, you have to be a distribution over that set. So what is BERT? BERT predicts words given a context. It does what's called the close task. That's C-L-O-Z-E. Um, so BERT cannot give you the probability of a string. It can give you the probability of a word given its left and right context. Um, there's actually quite a bit more to say on that topic, but the, the first order approximation is that BERT is not a language model. Okay, um, so any language model that's a distribution over sigma star can be visualized as a prefix tree. Now this doesn't seem very neurally. It doesn't seem very like, you know, connectiousness. You know, there's not a lot of consciousness happening here. Maybe there is, I don't know. But the point is that this, this is sort of what a language model is doing probabilistically. And this is important because when you reason about a language model, when you have this, this, this thing in the world that you can download with billions of parameters, you know, all it is doing is computing a distribution over a set. And it happens to be interesting because that set is big, it's infinite. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, so a language modeling, another way of saying this is distribution over sigma star, is that it's a weighting of the prefix tree. It's just a weighting of the prefix tree. Now for now, I'm going to let these weights be any non-negative real number. There's some four good-looking real numbers up there. So we can put weights on this prefix tree, uh, and what we can do, sorry, jumped ahead. I'll get used to this clicker eventually. So I put some weights on this prefix tree, and we can use this by descending, I'll show the formula in a second, to assign, um, to assign uh, weights to any string. And you know, if you recall by analogy to the log linear model, I could just say sum up all the weights of all the strings and um, say, well, I can renormalize. But what can go wrong? So is this, is this all there is to a language model? But unfortunately, this is sort of only where the, the interesting things start. Um, so the trick here is that if, if, if you think about, you're going to forecast where I'm going with all this. So I'm going to assign some non-negative numbers to elements of an infinite set. And I want to sum them. What could possibly go wrong with that? There's actually two things that could possibly go wrong. Um, but the obvious one uh, is it could diverge. Um, so let's think about this for a second. Um, so what we're going to do now Again, just to sort of, we're talking a bit of the technical stuff, but this is a bit of a higher level talk, which is when we talk about this idea of next word prediction, where does it come from and why? And what I'm going to argue is that it's, it's a mathematical convenience that we use. It has nothing to do with it actually being a language model. It's a convenience, and I'll explain why. Okay, so say we want to come with the distribution of this Cleany star, and again, I've done this BOS and EOS padding for convenience, uh, and every, node in this prefix tree has been associated with a non-negative non real weight, which I called theta of y less than or equal to t. What I mean by that is that I have this uh, subscript less than or equal to t notation that's the prefix up to t of the string y. So I'm trying to assign probability to a string y. I multiply together all the weights on the path, and I divide by z. You know, I, I didn't put my exp in there because it was non-negative to begin with, so I don't have to worry. Um, and then I say z, this is fundamentally the same formula. We said y, well, y, y is an infinite set, and this, we have z. So this is a perfectly fine thing to do, but z could diverge because I have an infinite sum. Um, so that's really, that's really problematic. And in fact, it's incredibly hard to deal with. This problem is so hard to deal with that virtually no one in the field deals with it. The, there's a couple recent papers that, that talk about, uh, again, energy-based language modeling. If you had to search for a, 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 a four-gram energy-based language modeling, I guess if you hyphenate the energy-based, it might be a trigram. But if you search for that, you'll find people who are dealing with this problem. And energy-based language models, fundamentally, they're trying to approximate Z. Also, my PhD advisor, uh, Jason Eisner, who was on the other side, this, this is something he loves to do. He loves to approximate Z. I actually remember Sanjeev, he taught a class when I was an undergrad. He called the partition function the devil once in class. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, 
So, so we have this problem. Uh, I've done nothing new. What I've done is I've convinced you that something like log linear modeling and the fact that we've removed the x, I want to say this again, the x is aesthetics. If I want something to be positive, I can say theta must be positive or I can bake in an x. It's purely style. This is fundamentally the same model you saw before, just a, a bit more notation. So I want to place the model over sigma star. That's my goal. Okay, so there are two approaches um, to doing this, two approaches. Um, and the first is global normalization. And this is the energy-based approach, which is that, you know, you sort of, you know, you get your act together and you say, I'm going for it. I'm going to compute Z. Um, and there are cases where this can be done tractably. Uh, I won't have time to go over them, but I'll, I'll drop some names of some fun algorithms. Um, those, typically the name of the game of the structure prediction is that you have a trade-off which is you make some assumption, some statistical simplification. Uh, and then with that simplification, you get a fast algorithm. So you have a computation expressivity trade-off. So that means if you want some fancy neural model that looks at the entire history, you're not going to have an efficient algorithm. In fact, you, you can prove that depending on the assumptions. You can prove that computing Z would be NP-hard, uh, or actually undecidable in the general case but you need some assumptions. Okay, the other strategy, so, so when I say, I should note that when I say global normalization, uh, that's the same thing as energy-based. There's a lot of different words people throw around for this idea, depending on your community, your background, and how you feel about it. Uh, the physicists calls this, call these things Markov random fields. That sounds a bit more impressive. Global normalization is a bit more pedestrian, I guess. <laughs> it's all in the name. Okay, so local normalization. Um, is the other strategy. So local, ah, well, I'll get the hang of this. Local normalization uh, is what the name might suggest is making a series of local predictions. And again, you can show that any model can be written, written like this, but what, what the strategy is here is that we're gonna bake this in to the model and then it's always gonna sum to one, we hope. There's a little caveat that we'll get to. Okay, um, so as I said, global normalization, we need an efficient algorithm. A lot of the lectures in my course deal with this, and we'll talk a bit about it in the case of parsing. Um, but for language models, there's never going to be a general purpose algorithm. And, and the, the bottom line is that whenever you have an infinite set, you have to be very careful you're decidable. And it turns out that if you allow a rich enough arithmetic, infinite precision arithmetic, it's undecidable to compute Z. Like, we're, we're beyond being hard. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, so this, you don't even get that, you know, you don't even get that fun caveat where if P doesn't equal NP, it's, it's straight up undecidable. But okay, that aside. Um, there are certain special cases. For instance, if you have a back off language model, you can run uh, Floyd Warshaw. Now this is an algorithm you probably, some of you saw in algorithms class. It, it's generalized to all sorts of semi-rings. One of the generalizations is called uh, Kleene's algorithm, due to Kleene, he also generalized it. Um, as a fun fact, what Kleene actually proved was he used the Floyd Warshall algorithm to convert any regular expression, or sorry, any finite state machine to a regular expression. So it's a very general algorithm. Um, and if you took my class, I'd teach you all about semi rings and fun things. Um, that's actually the most divisive part about the class. Half of them get on board with it, and half of them um, write me that they didn't do a math degree for a reason. <laughs> um, okay, so where are we now? Okay, so local normalization uh, is this idea. Um, and we're not gonna spend too much time on it, but I, I'm gonna give you the vibes. So the idea here is that given every node, the weights of its children must sum to one, okay? So let's look at that first guy. I think I got this, there we go. Let's look at this first guy. Did the children sum to one? Did I do the arithmetic? I have a 0.2, a 0.1, a 0.2, and a 0.5. Seems like it's one to me. Uh, and I do this, uh, and you can show that if you, if you strategically choose the weights in this way, basically Z will always be one. Z will always be one. Okay. So this, this, is, uh, this is not quite true, as we'll get to, um, but it's almost true. But this, this is the idea of next word prediction that we were talking about. This is what happens. People cannot compute the partition function. They cannot deal with it. It's an infinite sum. So they say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna locally normalize. And you see, where does the next word prediction come in? It comes in right here. Uh, if I'm right here at this node A, I go back to the root and I say, okay, my context is A, and these are the things I could predict. Predicting a word given its context, except this is visual. 
So it's easier to get your head around than a, a formula. Okay. Um, so just the notions uh, that you multiply the weights along the path and the sum of the probability of all children given their parents is one. Okay. So um, one note is that um, you might ask, when do I get efficient algorithms? What, makes, what would make this efficient? Well, um, you could think about this as like computing Z as a dynamic program. But the thing about dynamic programming on a tree like this is that there's basically no structure to share. So it's like a trivial case where we're, there's no structure to share, so it's not being shared. If I have an n-gram model, the structure is being shared. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about a bit, just because I want to put this on everybody's radar, which is to say, if I define a language model like this, its partition function might actually be less than one. So why can this happen? Um, so, um, so the idea is one necessary condition is that you always need to have EOS as a descendant. So how can I, how can I mess up? So imagine I have a prefix tree like this, and if I take this left branch, I go all the way down, and I continue this pattern where the probability of having another A is one. But what happens in that situation? I have an infinite string. It just goes on and on and on. And in fact, the probability of having an infinite sequence of A's is 0.5. But wait, I, I told you an infinite series of A's wasn't in sigma star, so it's escaped. Um, so you have to be a bit careful. So a necessary condition is that you always need to be able to get EOS. No matter how far down you go, you need to be able to find EOS. That's important. Um, and I think I skipped that. Anyway, um, and so traditionally we factor these models in terms of the chain rule of probability. So this is what I was saying in terms of network probability. So we, we go to, I think my slide's got one out of order. That's okay, we're gonna roll with it. Um, so the idea is that we're basic, we, when we want the probability of a string, we factor it like this, and this is completely readable off the graph. Um, so the, the question here then becomes, how do we estimate these probabilities? Okay, and that's, that's the fundamental language modeling question. So how do they estimate probabilities these days? They have a really, billion parameter neural network. Um, but that's a choice. Uh, and that choice will change. And this is why I teach students this. Because in 20 years, when I teach language modeling, I don't know if I'll use these slides because they'll, they'll kind of look like, um, you know, 1990s PowerPoint to the next generation. Um, that's a bad look. But this content will not change because this is what a language model is. And it will be a language model in 20 years and in 100 years, the same way the derivative will be the derivative in 100 years. But how we estimate these local probabilities will surely be different. I don't know how it'll be different, but it, it won't be done with a big transformer. Okay. Um, and finally, um, back to tightness, what I want to say is that um, when, when the language model loses probability, we, we call it non-tight. So it's tight. Um, it's tight if it doesn't. Um, so one way of giving a sufficient condition, I gave you a necessary condition, to give a sufficient condition is that EOS given a parent is bounded away from zero by a constant. That's actually too strong, uh, a lot too strong. And it had never been worked out. So we have a paper at this conference uh, where we gave this nasty little expression, which is uh, an exact characterization of it. So if you want to know when exactly your language model is a language model, uh, we can tell you. Um, so one of the things that's most interesting about this, I'll, I'll say a bit about these sorts of things, because we were able to prove that every transformer language model is tight. Um, among other things, um, what's, what's, what this result sort of implies is that a lot of people are asking reasoning questions about language models. Um, and tightness has an interesting relationship to, as I said, a Turing completeness. Um, insofar as I said this was an undecidable problem. Uh, so if I prove that I can, that this, 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 if I prove that this partition function is one, that means, and I, I know it's one in this model, it's not undecidable. So I can't actually encode really complex reasoning tasks with transformer language models. Um, and in fact, there's sort of an, uh, there's sort of a, an open question, which is the expressivity of transformer language models, which is I think we're going to give the first proof of encoding arbitrary n-grams, which I think is, ex everyone believes to be true, but has never been shown formally. But it cannot even be shown that a transformer language model, these big ones, encode arbitrary weighted regular languages, so very low down the Chomsky hierarchy. So this, this all comes together in sort of these pieces that we have very 
very computationally restrictive models that are big. People like to call them powerful, people like to claim they're conscious, um, but they're certainly not Turing complete. And they probably can't recognize, in fact, they, they can't recognize arbitrary weighted context free languages. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. Okay. Uh, and finally, I want to mention that conditional language modeling, um, a lot of tasks fit very naturally into this framework. Um, machine translation, speech recognition, summarization, and dialogue systems, name a few. You basically just train a language model uh, and you condition on, uh, you condition on the, some input. Uh, okay, so this is sort of my introduction to um, the theory of language modeling. That was 20 minutes or so. I'm now gonna spend 20 minutes going through some popular language models, past and present, and then we're gonna move on to, to, to parsing. Were there any questions about my brief introduction to what a language model is? Everyone know what a language model is now? Bird is not a language model. Um, in fact, it's, it's undecidable to, ter to, decide, to determine whether something is a language model. Any questions? Okay, so let's go over some popular, yes. That's a good question, I have no idea. I, I, would, I would argue that no one else does either. Um, but I think, I, think it's, um, I think it's common these days to posture in front of the media if you're an AI scientist telling everyone that something bad is coming, so maybe I should be doing that. Um, okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm getting to neural uh, engram language models. Um, so the reason I, uh, so I'm gonna teach effectively a very famous paper by Yashua Bengio by uh, 2003. Um, it is the first sort of neural engram, uh, neural network that did very well. And I think what, what sort of bothers me about um, the discussion around some of these neural networks is that neural networks are often uh, cast as an op opposition to some engram models, uh, as like engram models came before and they were supplanted, when the initial neural language models were engram models. Um, engram, uh, I'll put up a definition in a few slides. The engram assumption is, is just a conditional independence assumption. It's an assumption on your prefix tree. And what you choose to, how you choose to weight your prefix tree is up to you. If it's a neural network, you know, it's fine. Okay, so um, how do we estimate P? So I told you what a language model was, um, but that was a question of probability. And now we have questions of statistics. So what do I mean by this? When I tell you what a language model is, I'm telling you how to construct a probability distribution over a very nuanced set. And because that set is infinite, things can go wrong. Because that's, you know, you probably remember that from calculus, things can go wrong. Um, so you have to be very careful. But now, once we've done that, once we've constructed a valid statistical model, or sorry, a valid probability, probability model, we have a statistics question, which is how do we estimate a model from data? That is fundamentally a statistics question. So what we, what we do here, is we have to parameterize a family of models that are language models, so we have to start making assumptions. Now, the first thing you wanna do as a scientist is you wanna think about those assumptions. Do I think those assumptions, are they good assumptions for language? Are they bad assumptions for language? Do they, are they bad assumptions for language, but they work really well anyway? Which is what the engram assumption, we'll see. Um, so, so now we're gonna get into the other point. So, so how do I parameterize a language model? Um, so the simplest way, um, the original way was something called the n-gram assumption. Uh, so the n-gram assumption uh, basically says, I'm going to define my little prefix tree probabilities, or these locally normalized probabilities, um, as um, the probability word given the last n minus one characters. So the whole thing is n. So why does this make it easier? So we typically call what's to the right of the bar in language model, the history. It's a very, it's a very old term. Um, I don't think they call it that way anymore, but they used to call it that way. If you cracked open Fred Jelinek's book, it would be called The History. Um, so what this effectively does is it tells me I have a finite number of contexts. And the idea is that this is gonna make it easier to estimate. It's a simpler model. And what I'm gonna sort of build up to is how people parameterize this and why people think neural networks are a good idea. Because it's important to understand that, well, I've gone from an infinite number of parameters in the sense that if I tried to put a parameter for every context, it'd be infinite, to finite. But this is still big. In fact, this is exponential in n. It's still a massive number of parameters. So what we're gonna see 
is that this very naive model, where I put one parameter in every context, has massively more parameters than your average neural network, because that's growing really fast. Okay. So one point on uh, just a minor note about expressivity. Um, you might know that this, this, this is basically a, a regular, uh, it's a weighted regular language. So if you, if you remember from theory of computation, if I have a language and it only looks at the past n characters, it's regular. But it's actually much less restrictive. You can't encode most regular languages like this. So you can encode things like parity check or many, many languages can't be encoded like this. But, um, yeah, so we have this n-gram assumption. And where do we go with it? Um, so the idea um, is that we're going to jointly estimate a very large number of log-linear models. And that's fundamentally all, all early language models were. Um, they still kind of are that. Uh, which is to say that we have this finite history I think I reversed it given the last slide. I should make a note to fix that. Um, the order of these tokens with the indices. Um, but anyway, we have this finite history. Uh, and then we have a language model. Uh, and what we do with this language model, and this is sort of, uh, this is sort of building up to the Bengio idea, uh, which is that we're going to have an embedding. We're going to have a vector in Rn. And that's going to represent the context. And we're going to learn it. So I don't actually have to tell you where it comes from. We're just going to backprop through it. It's going to happen. Um, and then I'm going to have a word vector, which is a vector for every word. Uh, so this is, this is finite, finite number of words, the elements of V or sigma, depending on your notation. And I say that the probability of this word, given this context, is, is proportional to the expen. And remember, the only reason we have this expen there, the only reason, is because x is non-negative. That's it. In fact, you can, you can make it a, you can get a lot of probability models if you made it a max of zero and x or something. Um, um, and then we take this dot product. What happened there? And the intuition of the dot product is, is this is where you start getting into the, the sort of geometric aspects of deep learning, where the dot product is, is basically a notion of similarity. So I have a word vector, it encodes a word, I have a history, it encodes a history, and I want to know how similar they are. So what is this doing intuitively? It's saying, place high probability on words that are similar in some vector space to a context. And we're going to have to learn all of this. Um, so for whole sentences, we have this. I've omitted the BOS padding. This is wild. Uh, BOS padding for convenience. But we have the probability of sentence is just the product of the local predictions given their histories. OK. So when you talk about statistical estimation, um, this is the point I, I want to come back to, which is to say, you know, there's a lot of theory uh, and in, about how much data you need. Now, in the case of a very simple model where, say, we, we put one parameter on every context word pair, you would have an exponential number of contexts, an exponential number of parameters. Um, in, and this model is really great. It's convex in the parameters, if you did that. You know, it's, you, you get some great guarantees, but the amount of data you'd need to fit that many parameters is massive, absolutely massive. Um, and for that reason, it's sort of untenable to not have structure shared between the contexts. And in fact, most of language modeling from the, the 80s till, till now is fundamentally about one thing, which is how do we share the structure between contexts? How do we share the parameters between contexts? in such a way that we can generalize the new sentences. Because the wonderful thing about language is that it's full of sentences you've never heard before. Syntax is productive, which is, this is why it's, it's often called the infinite gift, which is that every sentence I'm saying right now has likely never been said before. Uh, and if you, know, if you take it in longer chunks, that's, that's it's true for everyone. There's just so many possible sentences. So how can we hope to estimate you know, any sort of distribution from, from finite data. We have to have some shared structure and, and I mean, I think, I think that's sort of just a, a very, the intuition between most, most of these models. Okay. Um, so Bengio was, this is a very famous paper in GM, published in JMR in 2003, uh, and it was the first neural uh, network that worked. So this is a big deal in deep learning. There's often the first people that did it. You can find multi-layer perceptron-based language models um, around 
from the 70s. Um, depends what you do. Even longer, I mean, I think, depending on how exactly you define those terms. Um, but it's really a continuous spectrum. But th this, is, this is, for, is a paper that worked, which is to say that they, they achieved very good results um, using a neural engram model. And it was the first neural network to achieve relatively um, good results. And, and, but you know, the downside was they, they were too slow. And, and the reason they were too slow is actually kind of a silly reason. Um, it, they actually couldn't sum over the, the, words, the, v, the, the words in the vocabulary fast enough. This, this, there's a whole line of research in the early two, uh, 2010s that focused on this. But that problem just went away with scale. Um, it's kind of interesting how increased compute just fixed a major research area overnight. Um, but when I started my PhD in 2013, um, basically you couldn't really train this very easily because the computers weren't fast enough. And it wasn't even about parallelization. Um, okay. okay, so the fundamental problem um, that they tried to solve is, is often called the cursor dimensionality, which is that you want to model a joint distribution between many random variables, um, and there's just too many parameters. So what word embeddings do, and fundamentally this is the idea behind neural networks, is that we're going to share the structure in a way that allows them to be estimated jointly. And it's going to reduce the number of parameters. Uh, so this is sort of a pictorial view. Uh, this is the original picture from Bengio's uh, paper, where we have the index. And you see this is an n-gram model. Um, they have the last three words. They have a series of embeddings. Uh, they run it through a neural network. And then you have the next word prediction. It's just stacking different log linear models and tying the parameters. Um, in sort of our pictorial view, we fundamentally have this, where we have embeddings for every word, we bring them together, some sort of vector concatenation, um, and then you put it into a softmax prediction. And what I want to emphasize, which is what I sort of emphasize when I teach this, which is the reason I don't dwell on all this, this the notation here. So I, I put some equations up here, but they're not fundamental equations. They could have been anything, really. The important thing is the space you're putting the probability over, and the structural assumptions like the n-gram model. The rest is, is sort of a, you know, a YOLO situation. People just, they go with, with what they feel. And there's, there's not a lot of rigor, and there's not a lot of reason to choose this over something else. For instance, why should it be that I encoded each of these in a word embedding, and then I concatenated them together and ran it with an MLP with this many dimensions? It's, it's very hard to give you a rule of thumb. It's very hard to tell you why to do a certain thing. Uh, and for that reason, um, when I reflected on how to design an LP course, it made it very hard because you can't really justify these things. They're not underlying principles. When you teach something like Newton's, uh, Newton's laws, then you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, they're from the book. They, they're going to be around. But this stuff is uh, a bit arbitrary. But anyway, the, the big point here uh, is that we have defined local conditional probabilities. This is sort of a very simple formula of a log linear model. We've defined contexts as some function, sorry, context embeddings as some function of the last couple words, and we have word embeddings. And this comes together to give us a model that actually has significantly fewer parameters than sort of a basic n-gram model would. Um, and this idea of having fewer parameters is really how you fight the cursive dimensionality because it forces the structure to be shared. And you sort of get into like the, the fundamental reasons of why language is learnable. I mean, if you take like a very abstract learning theoretic view, there sort of has to be, there has to be some structure sharing or else humans couldn't learn it. That's more or less a statistical reinterpretation of some of the arguments Chomsky made. Chomsky famously um, argued for innateness. And what he meant by innateness is one of the most um, misrepresented and somewhat controversial ideas in linguistics. He basically said this. He said, language is an infinite system. Humans learn it real fast. Therefore, they have a prior. Um, but a lot of people get very upset over that, and I've never understood why. But um, if you want to poke the right type of linguist or the wrong type of linguist, you can, you can <laughs> talk about innateness. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so how do, we, how do we estimate this? Um, so we estimate the parameters by maximizing the log likelihood. This is the same concept that Niels was talking about, the log likelihood of the data. We take our text data. We have a distribution over, over text. We compute its log likelihood, and then we perform gradient descent. And if you, had, if you take my class, I will spend a whole lecture talking about back propagation, 
uh, also known as automatic differentiation, which is how you automatically compute this gradient in a sense. It's, it's a marvelous dynamic program. Okay, so we have a simple network. Um, okay. Good. Um, so, uh, are there any questions about that? What I want you to have taken away from these slides is the notion of the n-gram assumption and the idea that I can stitch together a neural network however I want. And I've come up with the distribution over strings. And that a lot of what's gone down in the NLP literature is how to adjust these components. Ran, I'm going to just make a quick comment that I think you said it clearly that although Benjo's wasn't the first paper on neural engrams that it was the first one that worked. Mm -hmm. I'll dispute that second part. <laughs> but then I agree with what you said after that, which is the first successful one was actually 89. Yeah. A bunch of Japanese people from ATR, Shikano was I think the last author. They had a n-gram, a bigram or a trigram language model with a vocabulary of about 100. Mm -hmm. And they actually showed improvement in the speech recognition task, I think. The only reason that didn't take hold is because they had, at that time, Japan was a superpower in high performance computing, and they had access to the high performance cluster in Japan. And so they trained on, like I said, a 100 word vocabulary and a, trigra a, a trigram neural model and showed improvement on some task. <laughs> That's exciting. I'd like to see the paper. Yeah, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move into recurrent neural networks. Um, so. Um, one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to discuss transformers. I, I, I have some slides on them, but I, I think transformers are very complicated to discuss um, because um, fundamentally we don't know a lot about why they work or why they should work, and I'm in the process of thinking more about it. But I'm, it's very hard for me to give you a little uh, a take-home message about transformers other than the results are good. So uh, if you, and some results about parallelization. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks for a bit. Um, so recurrent neural networks um, were basically what, what came after n-gram models in, um, in the sense that the model everyone went to. And, and they're not sort of um, at all irrelevant in the sense that DeepMind recently put out a paper saying that recurrent neural language models are a bit, um, still perform better than transformers in some tasks. And a lot of what my group does sort of research-wise these days is we spend a lot of time developing very targeted artificial tasks to benchmark these models in very specific ways. Because um, fundamentally, the n-gram assumption is never, never going to be good enough for language. Because language exhibits center embedding, um, among other things. Um, that means you, it's, very interest, it's very easy to create sentences that can't be modeled by, um, by an n-gram model. So an example, like a simpler sentence, it's not center embedded, would be if I say something like I have a three-gram model, and I say uh, the keys on the, the red table belong to me. If I only get to look at the last three words, belong has to agree with keys. And I can't say the keys on the red table belongs to me. It's ungrammatical. But I can't make that decision if I can look far enough back. So that, that, that sort of fundamental issue is why n-gram models would never be enough. OK. Um, so what recurrent neural networks did, um, is that they sort of, they come up with a way of having like an infinite amount of context. It's a way of sharing parameters across an infinite number of, of, of different histories. Um, so the way you do that is you create a recurrence, which is you update this vector h we had, which before was created from the n-gram embeddings, from the context. Um, so there's many, many different flavors of RNNs, um, but they all sort of roughly look like this where I have some, I keep my log linear model, I keep the same notation. So I'm a big fan of, of keeping notation consistent when po um, possible. And the only thing that changes here is that I have some function f that recurses, I have an ht here and ht minus one there. So I have a recursive connection that allows me to update the context. And this is a very natural way to create an embedding for an infinite set. So these are often visualized like this. There's some domain-specific jargon that goes with RNNs. For instance, um, this function f is often called, to some, uh, called something like a cell for some reason. I'm sure there's a reason, but uh, I don't know it. Um, um, 
So the famous paper here was a cognitive science paper out of the, the uh, distributed processing or uh, PDP group, parallel distributed processing, uh, processing group, which was called Finding Structure in Time. It's a very bold, bold title. Um, the time here was, was the subscript T, so it's actually left to right processing of language. Um, and this is where we derive the idea of an Elman network. Um, so element, so re recurrent neural networks have been around a lot longer. And in fact, I there's, there's a view of RNNs that they're basically sort of dynamical systems, nonlinear ones. Um, so there's a sense in which they've been around for a very long time. Um, but they're sort of, they sort of rose to, to prominence in language modeling a bit later. Um, so the fundamental idea here is that we're going to incorporate arbitrarily distinct contextual information and we treat word prediction as this discriminative language task as before. Um, and we basically just have this, this HT. Uh, and this is treated re recurrently. Um, so design choices in recurrent neural networks focus primarily on how you choose this recurrence. <coughs> a common way is this nonlinear function. This was Elman said. So he said, I'm going to have a, a linear function of my past context, a linear function of my past word, and then some nonlinear function. It also, this is sort of a variant where you have more parameters. You know, this, this variant is sort of like a, the case where this is a block diagonal matrix. And you end up with, with all these different variants where, where people are interested in, is there a question? I think the number of parameters is exactly the same. You can just think of anything. Uh, no, the W is bigger. This guy's bigger. Well, we can discuss that. It's not a minor point. Yeah, that w is able to combine both of them. Yes. That, that, that's a minor point, though. Um, we don't need to. Um, and then we have the, uh, this was Schmidt Huber's invention with Hochreiter of this even fancier thing. Um, and the design pattern here was what researchers did, was that they stared at, you know, they reasoned about the equations if they were something like circuits. And they said, I have um, forget gates and input gates and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they say, okay, this is kind of like a soft circuit. I want to come up with an architecture that, that works the way I think it should. Okay. And, and this is sort of how language modeling evolved. And so that people were coming up with these custom ways of de developing recurrences, and you end up with these very massive models with number of parameters. But fundamentally, I'll say, go back. Fundamentally, all they were interested in doing was ever was just predicting a word given its context. So all of this, all of this in this notation, you get into sort of like all the complexity is even in transformer language models, they all go into how do you define H of T? Okay, so that's sort of the, the high level view in language modeling. There are other variants. This is a, a simplified R um, LSTM that's quite popular called the GRU. Um, um, uh, automatic differentiation often goes by a different name for recurrent neural networks, back propagation through time, uh, and it's attributed to Werbos. You can read some great history of backpropagation on Schmidt Huber's website, where if you note, like the traditional backpropagation citation is 1985. So how did a generalization happen 11 years earlier? <laughs> you get all kinds of weird things. Um, but anyway, um, the idea here is that you can train this just with backpropagation, because even though it's a recurrence, you can unroll it on your training data. Okay. So even though I have, if I draw my RNN as some recurrence here, I can sort of unroll it. Okay. So before I, I want to wrap up here before I get to the, the, the grammar part. Um, fundamentally, what you should take away from this recurrent neural network part is something very simple, which is to say all language models are distributions over strings. Because we cannot compute Z efficiently, it's infinite sum, we resort to this technique called local normalization. You can do some very fancy math to figure out when and why your model is actually a distribution. Um, and in many cases, like, uh, it, it's quite simple. In some cases, it's not. Um, in the general case, it'll be hard. Um, and fundamentally, all of the complexity in parameters is how do you design HT in the simple formula. You can boil it down to something this similar, where I can flash some formulas at you, but to really get intuition, you have to play around with them and stare at them and these sorts of things. But fundamentally, everyone is just trying to represent contexts better using more parameters, or sorry, fewer parameters, so more efficiently. Okay, so this is sort of the idea of, of language models. So I've, I think that's about, I guess, 50 minutes. So I'm gonna now move on to the second part, which is 
uh, context-free parsing of CKY. Okay. Um, so this is going to be relevant for the um, exercise section this afternoon. So I start with a bit of linguistics, and then we're going to get roughly through, I think, the first three here. This one is, uh, we might go a bit into CKY. It's fun, but it's, um, it's a bit much, and we might run off some time. OK, we'll start with syntactic constituency. So one of my least favorite things about NLP researchers is th there are some of them, and I've, I've, you, know, you find very distinguished researchers at reputable universities say things like, I don't believe in syntax. Um, and, it's always, and, and I don't really understand what that means. I've questioned some of them, but it's, it's one of these religious takes, really. Because if you ask, like, what, what is syntax, fundamentally it's um, the fact that some, some sentences are viewed grammatical and some are not. And the, the same people that, you know, don't believe in syntax still construct sentences that follow the rules of grammar. They don't say things like, my name are Ryan. They say, my name is Ryan. They conjugate their verbs properly. Um, and uh, part of the reason, I think if you ask like when you know, and, and someone says, I don't believe in syntax, I don't believe in trees, I don't believe in this, they've sort of missed a fundamental bit about linguistics, a fundamental bit about NLP. And that fundamental bit is that linguistics is a natural science. It's a natural science in that there are facts of the world, which is how humans speak, which we can observe, and we're trying to model them. And you can reject the model, but you can't reject the, the data on how people speak. You know, it's like you can reject, uh, I think uh, Niels gave some great examples with the history of physics. You can reject someone's model or story of the evolution of the universe, but you cannot sort of reject the fact that there's data to be explained collected by our telescopes. Um, so with syntactic constituency, I'm going to talk about some of the data that we might want to explain and why researchers choose context-free grammars or probabilistic context-free grammars. Um, so syntax is the mathematical study of the structure of sentences. Um, and if you were in a linguistics department, you take a whole year of this, but um, you can get half a, half a lecture. Um, and there's many great textbooks of different traditions about, about syntax. Um, but what I really want to explain to you is fundamentally like what, what syntax is and why you should care and why people ever thought context-free grammars were a good idea. So context-free grammars were invented by Noam Chomsky. Um, in a very formal way. He's, he was a very formal mathematician in his early work. Um, you should look at his papers of Schutzenberger. He's, um, it's spelled like Schutzenberger, but he's, he's French, and at least the French people I know are very particular about it being Schutzenberger. Maybe someone here can explain it. But um, he, he, has, um, he basically does a lot of abstract algebra, and his goal was to come with a mathematical model of language. Okay. So let's talk a bit about um, ambiguity. So Niels talked about different types of ambiguity, and I'm going to sort of deep dive on syntactic ambiguity. Um, so I say there's overwhelmingly evidence that language is structured hierarchically. And what I'm going to explain to you in the next couple of minutes uh, is why this evidence exists. What do we mean by this evidence? Because what makes linguistics different, and this is sort of a, a controversial thing, which is a lot of linguistic evidence comes through introspection, which is someone asks themselves in their language, can I say that sentence? And that's a very weird thing if I say scientific data is collected by introspection. But you do it every time you write an essay. You ask yourself, is that sentence grammatical? Should I change it? Is this person going to think less of me because of that ungrammatical sentence? I, you know, did I dangle a participle? You know, we think about this. Um, so what I mean, it's like it's uncontroversial in the sense that no one can really deny that humans are capable of rendering judgments to some degree. There's some squishiness. No one's going to deny the squishiness, but to some degree on whether sentences are grammatical or not grammatical. Okay, so one way of thinking about human language is it's, it's structured in terms of constituency. So sort of a classic example uh, of, of why you might want this is an ambiguous sentence like, fruit flies like a green banana. Um, so this is ambiguous. Does everyone see both readings? I have fruit, flies like a green banana, because you know, maybe the fruit's been flown, uh, thrown. Or fruit flies is a noun noun compound, like a green banana. And here's a tree. Uh, which reading is this? I, this is just not going to point where I want it to, is it? Which reading is this? What, what does that mean if I parse the sentence like that? Any takers? Mm 
That's right. The fruit flies, and the, you see this because fruit flies are binding tighter. When we say hierarchy, we're talking about the, the order in which things bind, they come together. And fruit flies act as one. So linguists have a word when things act as one. They call them constituents. So fundamentally, a constituent is sort of a multi-word unit that functions as a single unit. And I don't want to get into, um, I don't want to get into what a word is, uh, because that's a rabbit hole. Um, but if you take for a second an idealization, we're going to spit on white space. Um, the observation is that if the first one is grammatical, John speaks Spanish fluently. The second one, John speaks Spanish and French fluently, is also grammatical. And in fact, I can put any noun phrase in there. I can say John speaks the table fluently. Well, that's a weird one. What does that mean? Well, Chomsky would say it's syntactically valid, but sem semantically vacuous. He had a famous example of colorless green ideas sleeping furiously. But the point is, I think there's a sense in which I say, John speaks the table fluently. You can probably construct a context where that makes some sense. You know, the table is some code that spies are using. You know, they're speaking the table. I don't know. But there's probably no world where I could really say, John speak the table fluently, or John speak Spanish fluently. It's, it's, it's very much a violation of our rules. And fundamentally, what syntacticians cared about is teasing those ideas apart and making them formal. For instance, I could say, Mary programs the homework in the ATH computer laboratory, in the laboratory, any prepositional phrase here can, can do. Mary programs the homework, you know, on the South Pole of Mars, in pajamas. I can, I can just put anything in there. And the point is, they're all grammatical. Because what I'm doing is I'm swapping a fundamental unit out of the sentence. So this is the intuition that made people arrive at the mathematical model that is context-free grammars. So when I, when, I, when I hear people saying things like, I don't believe in trees, for me, it's, it's like saying someone says, I don't believe in differential equations. Differential equations are a very useful model for many physical phenomena. I mean, you can believe that this particular model is a good model. You can believe it's a bad model. But fundamentally, there's nothing to believe in. Uh, it's a mathematical model of these sorts of things. So hopefully you guys all agree with me that this is real. Maybe someone, does anyone have a believe these sentences are not grammatical? No? Okay. I've got a lot of believers in syntax here. Um, okay. Uh, so one way to see this in ambiguous sentences often, as I said before, fruit flies like a green banana and fruit flies like a green banana. Also, I think my TAs put that in. Ambiguity makes language fun. It's really the, the root of all humor, if you think about it. Okay, so one thing that um, linguists do is they sort of catalog different types of ambiguity. So we can talk about different types of syntactic ambiguity. A very common one is um, attachment ambiguity. You see this all the time in newspaper headlines. You can follow some social media accounts that will just point out every time the New York Times has an attachment ambiguity. So I shot an elephant in my pajamas versus I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Um, who is in the pajamas. Um, what you find is humans are very good at disambiguating this according to context. Also, noun, noun, uh, modifier scope, noun, noun compounds. For instance, the plastic cup holder versus the plastic cup holder. I have a three noun compound, and in English, I can bracket them either way. Um, so the idea is that if I can break up a sentence into the combinations of grammatical constituents, I'm probably a grammatical sentence. So that's sort of the fundamental insight of a, a context-free grammar. And this idea is sort of the hierarchically, what we mean about hierarchy is that constituents are functions of other constituents. You build it up other from other constituents. Um, okay, so the, uh, a specific set of uh, tests people develop, they often develop, um, so there's some for English. So a lot of what, what linguists would do is they'll come up with, with sentences you can play around with, which reveal aspects of your language you weren't aware about. So one is pronoun substitution. If I say, Eleanor at the pad say you, Eleanor ate it. The fact that I can replace that noun phrase with a pronoun probably means it's constituent. Clefting. So this is a very cool thing in English. Um, not many other languages have it to the degree English does. But I say uh, it's very similar to, I think, a topic comment structure in some Asian languages. Um, but if I say, uh, John loves the red car, I can say it is the red car that John loves. 
I can do this for anything. I can say, it is John who loves the red car. I can, for, I can cleft, uh, I would say cleft out the, um, the noun phrase, front it, and that gives some sort of emphasis. And the point is I can only do this for constituents. So I think, if I know myself, I'll have some examples of where it fails. I do not share that. So let's do some examples of where this would fail. I could say, it's actually hard to do for, so we say, um, Like if you couldn't cleft out John loves, for instance, you say John loves the red car, you could say um, it is John loves that the red car. It'd be very hard to do. Um, and finer is, is ellipsis where I say Papa eats the caviar with a spoon. How does Papa eat the caviar? So in our example, you could say fruit flies like a green banana. It is fruit that flies like a green banana. And importantly, this one is not ambiguous anymore, right? is the fruit that flies like a green banana. Um, so many linguistic properties are defined over trees instead of strings, which means it's very hard to come up with an explanation of this if you just have the string. You need to know the hierarchical structure. And that's why linguists like trees. It's really that simple. It allows them to explain things because it's a mathematical model. The same reason physicists like differential equations. Uh, so one needs to, to, to parse trees to see subtle distinctions. Here's some, some examples from the binding principles. Um, so uh, this is sort of a very subtle point of English grammar. So we'll go slowly. Uh, Sarah dislikes criticism of her. Her cannot be Sarah. Right? You can say Sarah dislikes criticism of her by anyone. Uh, does anyone ever know how you'd say this if, if her was Sarah? Sarah dislikes criticism of herself. Um, Sarah dislikes anyone's criticism of her. Now her can be Sarah. <laughs> um, so you get these very weird um, situations where the exact tree structure determines how her can co-refer with this. The same way if I say, you know, the simple example that in, in the binding principle, I say John likes him. Him cannot be John. These are just some more elaborate examples. Okay. And in comparison to programming languages, what makes natural language different? Here's a programming language. What is, oh, let's see what this is. Looks like C. Um, so what makes this a bit, let's look at the sense of the time. Um, so about 10 more minutes, is that right? Yeah. So compared to programming languages, um, what we have that's sort of fundamentally different um, is that programming languages mark constituency structure. How is the constituency structure marked here? At least in C, there's the spacing, that sort of gives it away, but that's for readability. I could strip the space and this would still compile. I have these brackets. And in fact, what makes sort of natural language or programming languages easy is that they're designed to be easy to parse in linear time and they're designed to be unambiguous. So all the things that sort of make language fun and hard, natural language, we sort of got rid of in programming languages. So for instance, this would be what C would look like if it were a natural language. We have no precedence, we have a lot of overloading, and the grammar isn't known in advance. It's a hot mess. Um, they're also context-free. Human languages are typically a bit higher, but that's sort of a, a complicated topic. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss briefly in context-free grammars, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. We won't get into CKY, but that was for scene, and it's also not necessary for your exercise. Um, but the slides are online if you want to learn about CKY. Okay, um, so the big picture is this. Uh, a grammar is a formal system that defines a set of strings. So the way it works, is, is that we have an ordered, we have, we have a set of rules, it shouldn't be ordered, so the typo. Um, we have a set of rules that describes how to form strings from a language. Every rule can be written like this, where I typically have a, what's called a non-terminal on the left-hand side, and then a, on the right-hand side, I have a sequence of terminals and non-terminals. So the idea is that I keep rewriting, I'll do an example, until I get something that's just terminals, and then I said that's in my language. So that's sort of the more formal aspect. Um, the real formal, we typically say it's a four tuple. We say we have a distinguished start symbol 
which is a non-terminal. We have an alphabet. These are often lowercase letters. Um, and we say that our right-hand sides are in um, the set of terminals and uh, non-terminals. Um, so grammars are set in Chomsky normal form if all the productions look like this, um, with one exception of S, which should go to epsilon. OK, um, so the point of a grammar is that we, we get into a, a um, we get to encode a subset of sigma star. Um, and the idea is that we rewrite to do so. So now we'll do an example. Uh, here's a very simple toy grammar that will look at our fruit flies like, an, uh, fruit flies like a, a banana example. So I have rules on the left-hand side. Um, and I've used this bar notation as a shorthand. It means or. So that means S rewrites as NPVP or NVP. Um, and what I do is I start at S and I keep rewriting to everything is in sigma. So what this looks like is like this. And then I'm done. So the way it works is that if I can generate a string from this process, I say it's in the language of the grammar. If I cannot, it's not. So these models naturally encode hierarchical structure. Uh, every node in the tree is what we call a constituent. Uh, and this is, this is what Chomsky developed to model the phenomena we've been talking about. So phrase structure grammars like this, um, invented by Chomsky in 56, as you see they sort of a mechanism, a mechanism for producing the trees we had. Okay. So context free grammars can admit ambiguity, which means there can be more than one way of deriving a string. It's perfectly fine. This is how we recover our example. Um, and what we move on towards now, and this is where the NLP comes in, which is that to bring this sort of full circle, fundamentally, when we talked about a language model, what we meant was, can we sample a string from a probability distribution over sigma star? But what is this doing? It's giving me a subset of sigma star. So the question that was asked in the NLP community, uh, and even earlier, I think, um, was, can I augment this structure with something of a probability. That is, can I turn a grammar into a language model? And this is one of those cases where I think talking about next word prediction, you can, for instance, always come up with a next word predictor, but it's much more natural to think of it as a top-down generative process. So probabilistic context-free grammars are this very simple idea <coughs> where I assign weights. In this case, these are locally normalized. Given a, a left-hand side, they sum to one. This points in. And now, just like in the prefix tree case, I say that, OK, the probability of a tree is just the product of all the productions in the, uh, product, uh, all the, productions in the derivation. This differs from a prefix tree in that some of these productions don't have words. I've talked about non-terminals. But fundamentally, we have this object, and we're multiplying together probabilities. Um, now, the probability of a string in the case of ambiguity, is the sum of all the probabilities of derivations that yield that string. So PCFGs are locally normalized. So I want to get into a bit what I mean by that. So when I say a PCFG, it says a probabilistic context-free grammar. And you might say, couldn't I have non-locally normalized CFGs? Just put arbitrary real weights on them, non-negative real weights, and then compute Z. You could. But then historically, it would not be called a PCFG. We call it a WCFG. OK, um, so I, I can put this locally normalized model. As you can see, these, sort of, these ideas of local normalization come back over and over again, because this is a way of avoiding summing over all derivations. Um, you can also have WCFGs, as I said, um, in which case you might get something closer to a log linear model. So to relate this back to the sort of structure prediction, context free grammars they're originally developed as this mechanism to determine grammaticality of sentences, but the NLP community co-opted them and used them as sort of a backbone for complicated structured models over trees or strings. You can do either here. And this is sort of what's meant by structure prediction. They, these can be used as language models. They can be used as something other than language models if you come up with a distribution over trees as opposed to just strings. Um, 
And in the, as I said, in the, in the globally normalized case, we have to compute z. How big, is, how big is the set of all trees, t? It's infinite. It's even bigger than sigma star. In fact, uh, if ambiguous grammars of more than one tree for every string. Um, but they're both countable. Um, and I also run into this issue, like I had before, is can, can WCFGs diverge? Here's a very simple example of one that does. S3 writes as S, and S3 writes as A with 1. Uh, the sum, uh, each, sum, uh, each tree has, has, has weight 1. The sum of infinite number of 1s is infinity. So again, PCFGs, the P comes out of this desire to, um, to make the model tractable, to make to allow us to compute C. The tightness of PCFGs was investigated uh, intensely in the early 2000s by um, um, G. Chi and Stuart Geeman at Brown. So there's some results there as well. OK. Um, you can compute Z, um, but it's an iterative method. And that, I think we are right on time. Right. So then the last thing that I will not cover is how do we actually get a tree out of a PCG. What's an efficient algorithm for doing that? And that you'd have to, we did not get to.